Welcome to another episode of the Tom Trimmer Podcast. Happy Monday, everyone. And happy Thanksgiving to my fellow Canadians. Yes, it is Thanksgiving Day in Canada, and I know many of you will be celebrating today and, and spending time with family and friends. And I, look, I, I also need to acknowledge that not everybody looks at Thanksgiving as a happy occasion. Uh, clearly, historically, uh, the origins of Thanksgiving are, to say the least, less than favorable. Uh, indigenous people clearly look at Thanksgiving through a different lens, and that has to be acknowledged, um, certainly on a day like today. So if we can, you know, reimagine, you know, think about our truth and reconciliation and begin to rethink and reimagine what this long weekend or this celebration can look like, I think we could could move ourselves forward and be in a great place. But have to acknowledge the fact that while many of us are celebrating Thanksgiving today, uh, there's also a history that cannot be ignored. Now, actually, I'm traveling today to Southern California where I'm going to be conducting uh, day two of the Grading from the Inside Out virtual training tomorrow. Uh, That's going to be followed by a face-to-face training on Wednesday with Marco Forster Middle School in in San Juan Capistrano. And after that, I'm headed for Akron, Ohio for the Teach Better Conference, that conference I've been talking about all summer and throughout the fall. A couple of reminders as we get going today. Uh, The Grading from the Inside Out two-day training in Minneapolis, that's going to be December 1st and 2nd. And also the Michigan Assessment Consortium, there'll be a three-hour webinar. That'll be November 2nd. Uh, It is open to people outside of Michigan, so if you are interested in that, uh, there's links in the show notes for both of those events. If you're interested in checking those out, uh, those are available to you. All right, thanks for tuning in again this week. A big welcome to any new listeners joining for the first time, and a big thank you, of course, to longtime listeners. I appreciate all of you. This week, my guest is once again Dr. John Hattie. Uh, This will be part two with John, so if you did miss last week's conversation, last week's episode, I'd really encourage you to go back and listen to that episode as well. Now, you don't have to go back and listen to that one first. The two conversations really are kind of self-contained, so you could listen to this episode first and then go back to uh, last week's episode and check it out. And in Assessment Corner this week, I'm going to talk about the good old test and how a test can still fit within a balanced approach to assessment. So that's today's plan. Let's get to it. Part two of my conversation with John Hattie is coming up, but first, don't at me. But I'm going to open this week by stating that if schools want anything to count in the court of public opinion, then it has to be measured and it has to be clearly reported. Now, in the United States, of course, we hear these stories about how think tanks and other organizations figuratively beat up teachers, schools, and districts due to low standardized test scores. Those stories are awful. And in some cases, even within the district or the state or whatever the organization is, there can be funding implications associated with that test data. There can be teacher evaluation implications that go along with that. It is an unfortunate situation, to say the least, in so many places across the United States. Now, in Canada, we have organizations like the Fraser Institute that take, you know, testing data and start to rank schools and try to actively create this divisive narrative. Sometimes it's about public school versus private school. The situation in Canada is bad, but it's not nearly as bad as it is in the United States. Because I I know some Canadians like to use the expression, oh, high-stakes standardized tests. Um, But we don't have anything like that in Canada. And to compare our system to the United States is just a false comparison. It's hyperbole. It makes for some dramatic social media posts. But that's not what happens in Canada versus the United States. I heard more of that five to ten years ago on social media, but you still kind of hear it nowadays as well. It's the misuse of the standardized testing data, not the existence of it. It's the misuse of that standardized testing data. It's easy to spot. That's the problem, right? But we can spot it. And and what happens is it puts unnecessary and disproportionate amounts of pressure on the school system and teachers and educators and principals, et cetera, to raise test scores. That pressure can be so great in some places that we have seen a handful of educators over the years succumb to the pressure and act in very unfortunate ways, including changing scores so that the data emerges favorably. Now, I don't, I, I, I don't excuse that behavior, okay? But I'm empathetic to the conditions that led to those educators making those poor choices. We make poor choices when we act emotionally rather than rationally. And there is no doubt that the relentless pressure from stakeholders, from parent groups, from political organizations, and society as a whole, for some it's just too much, It can even be traumatic. And so they give in to temptation, hoping to just survive. Again, I'm not condoning it in any way, 
But that doesn't mean I can't understand the conditions that led to someone making such a poor decision. When all of this occurs, right, when the test results are released, the outside groups start sorting and ranking and pitting schools against schools, some advocating private versus public, um, our general response inside the education community tends to be dismissive of those assertions from the outside, which in so many cases we should be dismissive of those uh, narratives from the outside. But then we try to take this highbrow approach in response. We think we're being so clever and so intellectual when we quote Albert Einstein, or at least we use the quote that is attributed to him. In response to the outside noise, we try to rise above it and say, not everything that me that's measured matters, and not everything that matters can be measured. Look at us. So smart. So intellectual. And so entirely wrong. Einstein was not talking about schools, and everyone knows it. Now, it might sound good in educational echo chambers, sort of like the expression, learning for the sake of learning. Ugh. That one, that's another one. We all look around at each other and just dismiss the external noise and take comfort in the fact that they, the outside forces, well, they just don't get it. What a load of self-indulgent bullshit. The reason why we in education are so open to these damning critiques is because we typically offer nothing of substance in response to the to actually counter this narrative. We'll say something like, but standardized test scores don't tell the whole story. And that's true. We all know that. But then we fail to tell the rest of the story. Being dismissive of standardized test scores without ever offering the rest of the story in a real sort of substantial way, it, that, that just looks weak and defensive. And what I've noticed over the years in many places, and, and, and I'm certainly not saying the most to the majority, but what I've noticed in many places is that we like the standardized test scores when it tells a favorable story. When we're ranked number one, maybe we're in the top five. Suddenly, the standardized test scoring data gets on our newsletter. It gets on our website. But when it's unfavorable, we're quick to dismiss it. Here's the deal. I agree wholeheartedly the standardized test scores offer an incredibly narrow view of all that happens within a school. Now, I don't agree with the assertion that some people have that standardized test scores have no place in the education system. Every jurisdiction across North America and around the world has not only the right, but they have a duty to ensure that the system is serving its constituents, namely the students and families. They have a right to seek that information. It's not the whole story. We know that, but it's part of the story. And denying that is simply not credible. However, we need to start telling the rest of the story in a meaningful and a, and a substantial way. There is so much more to the school experience than just test scores, so we need to get that word out too. The growth that students are making, the equity that we're creating, the social competence that's developing, the social emotional skills that students are learning, their levels of curiosity, uh, their levels of exploration, the mental health strides that they're making, learning to be more um, you know, in tune with understanding themselves and how to handle pressure situations and anxiety, um, how they've learned to cope with past trauma, all of that. We need to start getting that story out there. But to do that in any kind of meaningful way, the rest of the story must be measurable. There needs to be a planned and purposeful effort to gather other data that can paint the complete picture. Rather than trying to run away from test scores or any of that very narrow view of school, tell the whole story so that test scores can be contextualized and understood within the bigger picture. Not as an excuse, not as a way of making an excuse, but as a way of understanding what schools are really about. If it's measurable, it will be taken more seriously. Now, when I use the word measurable, I'm sure for more than one of you, you thought about spreadsheets, numbers, and graphs. Now, that, of course, could be part of it, but that's not all what data is. You know that. We, of course, we have quantitative data, but we also have qualitative data. So we've got to create a more substantive way of telling our story as a school, we've got to get the word out. We've got to tell the rest of the story. 
and these fluffy, self-indulgent, oh, we can't really measure that, those types of statements are not helpful. That is not going to change people's minds. How can you, on the one hand, assert that there's more to the story or that something has occurred? How can you say that, but then in the same breath assert that, well, we can't measure that? Well, if you can't measure it in any kind of meaningful way, how do you know it occurred? How can you have any confidence that there is more to the story if you can't actually articulate how you know the more to the story exists? I'll tell you how. You can't. So we need to collect, and I use that word very loosely, as much other data as possible. We need to tell the rest of the story in a substantive way. We need to talk about those things, whether it's through surveys, whether it's through interviews with students and families, individually, collective groups of students. Obviously, we have to get everybody's permission for this, but interview them. Look at SEL data. Look at the way equity is growing in our schools and the way that we're reshaping those environments and, and, and being more culturally responsive, etc. We've got to start going on the offensive and creating the counter narrative or at least expanding the narrative to say, yes, this is one part of our school but there's a bigger story here. We track kids' growth over time and we show some longitudinal data. We've got to be more intentional about this. If you just leave quantitative data on its own, like standardized test scores on their own, it's going to dehumanize the view of school. We're just going to look at it as this mechanical exercise to raise test scores. We have to rehumanize school with qualitative data, information, stories that tell the whole story. This isn't about refuting large-scale assessment data, but putting the large-scale assessment data into context. We have to, as the expression says, control the narrative. Because if not, then the narrative will continue to control us. I want to welcome back uh, Dr. John Hattie. John, thanks for joining me again this week. We had a great conversation last week. I know listeners uh, really enjoyed that and uh, look forward to continuing our uh, conversation uh, today. And I want to get into some of the research details now um, and maybe have you lend a little bit of perspective as to what matters most uh, with some of the strategies that have higher effect sizes and some of the ones that are relevant to assessment and some of the work that I do and, and many others do uh, in the schools that we work with. But, but for now, let's, for those who are not familiar with, or, or maybe only vaguely familiar with, can you give us a little bit of a lesson on effect size and what it really means? We talked a little bit about this last week, but let's dig into it, maybe a little bit more technical. What is effect size? How do we figure it out? And why does it matter so much? And how do we best utilize it as educators? Well, effect size is uh, a measure of magnitude. How big is the effect? Is it a small, medium, or large effect? And there are two way, two main ways of calculating an effect size. One is you, you take two groups of students, and one group of student receives a treatment like reciprocal teaching, and the other doesn't. You calculate the average score across those two classes, subtract them, divide through by the standard deviation. I warned you, Tom, that was technical. It is mm -hmm. a, a very simple measure of the, the, the difference in the means um, calibrated on the same scale. The other way is you take a pre-post. I go into a pre-measure, introduce a treatment, and I do a post-measure. And the difference of the means, again, divided through by the appropriate measures, gives you a measure of effect size. Mm -hmm. there, there is actually a third method, and that is correlation. And that you could correlate, for instance, um, birth weight with later achievement in school. And that can be converted to an effect size. Now, each of those different methods have kind of different assumptions underlying them. And yes, some of my critics have pointed out that I've put them together and maybe I shouldn't have. And in my current recent work, I have been separate. It turns out it hasn't made a bit of a difference. doesn't mean to say you shouldn't look at them. It's different. Um, but it really is critical to ask. Does it make a difference how you calculate the effect sizes? No, it doesn't. But there are different ways of doing it. But it fundamentally is a measure of how big is the effect. Like what we did in statistics and for, for, for many, many decades was ask, is it statistically significant? That is, is it different from zero, from having no effect? And that is an important question. But it doesn't ask then, how big is the, the effect? Like there was a recent meta-analysis on teacher performance pay. Uh, 
and the authors wrote at the end, because it was statistically significant, we should really be concerned with, with performance pay. And the effect size was 0 0.04. Mm. That's a fly spec. You right. couldn't see it. And so it was misleading, in my view, as to the conclusions they made, because they highlighted the statistical significance. And because they had an incredibly large sample sizes, if you sneezed, you got significance. And so this notion of effect size is a very powerful way, very simple, of saying how big is the effect? It's as simple as that. Yeah. Uh, everything has an effect size, either positive or negative. Uh, it, what's the threshold? What, what's the threshold where we should be really paying attention to the the size of the impact and, and really making a concerted effort to pay attention to the details of implementing those strategies or practices? Well, you hit a nerve there, Tom. Like what I've been doing is saying, I'm, I'm not, my, my interest is let's not use zero as the threshold okay. uh, because it turns out 95 to 98% of things we do to kids, we can get an effect above zero. And that's mm -hmm. my criticism of the, what works clearly, if you're going to argue what works, everything does virtually. Right. Um, so what I said is let's take the average of all effect sizes over the 400 million kids in the sample size and it's 0.4. And that hasn't changed. And it's not surprising it hasn't changed when you got that kind of sample size. Right. And now I get criticized because people say, oh, it's too high. Well, no, it's just an average of all the effects. And my fascination is what's the common denominator amongst those influences greater than 0.4 compared to below 0.4. Now, if you take um, a regular school class, 0.4 may be very high. Uh, maybe if you get a 0.2 effect, you're moving in the right direction. Hey, I'd take it. Um, if, and one of the things you need to be really careful about is how wide is the, the content you're looking at. Like if you're looking at changing vocabulary scores, you're more likely to get a larger effect than if you're going to look at changing creativity scores. So that's one consideration you need to take into account. And so what we do in schools in our work is we say, let's forget the 0.4. Let's out work out what your average is on what you've been doing, regardless of what the number is. And let's look at those kids that you've got above average and those kids you've got below average and ask, what's going on here? So that average is needs to be taken into account of what the question you're asking. My question is, across all the research, 0.4. Now, one critic has said, oh, but in high schools, you can't get 0.4. Well, if you're looking at something like reading and num numeracy, then he's right because kids that by the age of 12 have got to the threshold where it doesn't matter so much beyond what they go. But can you get 0.4 in high school? Absolutely. Every day it can happen. And so there are some myths out there about what that threshold is. And I think it, it, it matters what's the question you're asking in the context you're asking. But in my work, 0.4 has been the threshold. It hasn't changed. I also asked many years ago, using different data, um, the NAEP data, SATs in England, uh, EASTL in New Zealand, NAPLAN in Australia and say, what's the average effect when a kid goes from one year to the next year? And it turns out it's 0.4. So it's reasonably robust. And that's regardless of years. Now, it does get smaller in high school if you measure something like generic reading or generic numeracy. Once again, context matters. So I've given you a long-winded answer, but the answer is context matters. Yeah, context always matters, uh, but it is a good guideline in terms of impact. Um, but you also have to contextualize it so you know what your needs are. We talked last week about the importance of diagnosis. You know, what problem or what question are you trying to address before you decide to implement anything is important to be pointed on that. Now, I want to ask you, uh, and I think we, again, we touched a little bit upon, upon this last week. What What is the most thoughtful way for educators to consume the visible learning research? You know, some seem to treat them almost like FIFA rankings where, uh, you know, they walk around and they have, and I know you talked last week about not publishing the rankings and maybe that was a response to that. Cause I've heard people say, Oh, there's going to be a new number one next year or something like that. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, as far as the, uh, effect sizes and all of that, is there, what's the most thoughtful way when, when we get the new edition and we consume that, what's the most thoughtful way for us to think about consuming the research? Where I've come in my journey uh, on this is, is is always trying to get at that core notion of what is that difference between mm -hmm. those above and below that point four and their impact. And it comes back very much to how we think. And I have written uh, a number of works on mind frames. 
um, the ways of thinking. And when I go a step further, underneath those mind frames is this concept of evaluative thinking, mm -hmm. the ability to critique yourself, the ability to ask about great diagnosis and how I can improve upon that. Um, it is, and this is the hardest part of it, it is, can I stand in the shoes of my students and yeah. see my teaching through their eyes? Can yeah. I in the staff room stand in the shoes of fellow teachers and see their, their world through their eyes? And that's a massive skill. Um, and it turns out it's pretty much a key skill of those that have dramatically positive effects on kids. And so in answering your question, it's how do we get, how can I get faster to getting that language articulated in schools? Those teachers are incredibly successful. How can I get them to think aloud um, and, and hear their critique? How can I make that high trust where we welcome their ways of thinking? Not because they're right or wrong, but I want to hear how they make their judgments, how they make those moment by moment decisions. And that's what I'm really trying to get, get to is that concept of expertise about how we think. And that's what's sometimes missed when people look at our work and say, oh, I just have to do A, B and C and I've got it. Right. No, it's about how you think. And that's really the hardest thing to do, but the right thing to do. Yeah. I always found it interesting when people would be almost dismissive of that, which was ranked seventh on the list or eighth on the list. And I just, I just never felt right that that's the way we, uh, we consume that. Um, I want to dig into a few specifics now and, and pick up on a few topics that I think are quite important in today's educational context. And the first I want to talk about is feedback. Uh, one of my frustrations, and I work in the area of assessment and grading and feedback and all of that. And one of my frustrations is almost the oversimplistic way with which feedback is referred to or talked about. When we know feedback is quite nuanced, it's context dependent, and there's a lot of nuances to how we present feedback. So we know that the mere existence of feedback is not enough to impact student learning. So I guess the question for you is, what are some of the key aspects of feedback or some of the key routines that lead us to ensuring that our feedback is actually effective in improving student learning? When, right from the very beginning of this work, feedback's featured <clears throat> as one of the common denominators of success. Mm -hmm. And it's probably the one that I've spent the most research time on for the very reasons you have said there, Tom, like a third, up to a third of feedback's negative. Right. Um, probably 90% of feedback given isn't received. 95% um, of feedback is about the content. So there's a whole, whole deep notion of feedback in there. And one of the mistakes I made in my career is I spent a lot of time looking at feedback from the teacher's perspective finding ways to improve the amount of feedback, the effect of feedback. And it wasn't until I realized that, hey, maybe I should look at it from the kid's point of view. And over the last four or five years, we've spent a lot of time looking at how feedback is received. And our bottom line is that it, feedback needs to be heard, understood, and actionable. Um, and this is really as you put it, a nuance, but this is something that we don't spend a lot of time on. We give it and we assume, therefore, it's it's gotten. People receive it. And so, yeah, it is one of the, the hardest things to get right. Um, now, the average effect of feedback is pretty high. Can you imagine what the effect would be if we got it right all the right. time? <laughs> and so true. I'm not saying it's not important. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah. We should be giving lots of feedback, but we should also be attending and constantly and like standing in the shoes again. I need to stand in your shoes, Tom, and understand... What feedback did you hear? What did you understand? What What's actionable? And like when people say to me, what's effective feedback? I say, it was heard, it was understood, and it was actioned. Right. If it wasn't actioned, it wasn't. Now, there is another factor in here that's dramatically powerful. When we ask teachers about the concept of feedback, they talk about you know, corrections, clarifications, commentary, um, where the kid's going, um, and particularly how well they're going. When you ask kids, they say none of that. To them, there's only one answer. Feedback helps me improve. And if you're not going to help me improve, they can stand there, as we did in one of our studies a couple of years ago, with two pages of written feedback that had no improvement information. On it. They stood there with these two pages, waved it at me and said, I got no feedback. Now, the teacher said, I gave you two pages. Now, what the kid means, there's nothing in here that helped me improve. Now, here's a problem. There has to be an opportunity. If there's no opportunity to improve, the kids think the feedback is just about past history. It's a critic. It's a comment that something they've done. And so they don't value it. 
And so feedback from the kid's point of view has to be about improvement, has to be heard, understood in action. One of the things we're doing in our, our work here in Australia at the moment is with teacher performance evaluations. And we're turning it on its head and saying, what is the teacher hearing, understanding and, and actioning? And if they aren't, then the teacher evaluation model is wrong. And wow, does that get rid of a lot of teacher evaluation models? I'm a fan of teacher evaluation models, but we've got to get them right. And we've got to stand in the shoes of the teachers and see that. So feedback, yep, very, very powerful, very hard to get right, but we have to get it right because it is so powerful. Yeah, the uh, the actionable part for sure, uh, ensuring that students re-engage with their learning. And it, and it really is designed to improve the learner uh, and the transfer, you know, having that feedback that is transferable uh, and allows them to impact their long-term learning for sure. I have often heard you say, and I, and, and this is something I think teachers misunderstand, so I'm hoping you'll clarify this for listeners uh, out there. I've often heard you say that some of the most powerful feedback is feedback that comes from the student to the teacher uh, in that direction. Um, so what, and I think a lot of people kind of wonder or misinterpret what that means in terms of what that would sound like, what that would look like, or what do you mean by that? So walk us through that maybe. Uh, what does that mean, feedback? What kind of feedback is coming from the student to the teacher? Well, let me start in a slightly different place. Uh, Tom, I'm okay. going to teach you and you're going to be in my class today and I'm going to give you a, a class on um, how to do exercises and way I go and I'm going to ask every now and then a few questions and I'm going to pick someone and if they don't get the right answer, I'll pick another person who gets the right answer. And at the end, I'll give you some activities and at the end of it, I'll walk out of there and say, hey, I did a great job. Now, I, I want me to pause every now and then and listen to you, Tom, about how you're thinking, uh, whether you are feeling comfortable doing these exercises, where you're struggling. And so I have to be open to listening to you to get that feedback so I can adjust my teaching, which is what great teachers do. And so this is the essence of students giving feedback to teachers. Like mm -hmm. some kids by the age of eight have learned that if they don't know, look like they do, so you don't get picked off. Um, now, a great teacher can see through that. And, and so we, this is the whole notion of kids giving feedback to teachers. Like I'm not talking about doing student evaluations of teaching, even right. though I'm a fan of that. I think we should be doing a lot more of that if it leads to improvement, if it leads to us understanding. Um, we've been using a, a, an app, a Verso, where at the end of the lesson, the kids can put in their feeling about what their feeling is in the lesson. And, you know, 60% of the kids uh, put in positive feelings, 40% put in negative. And of the negative emotions, one emotion dominates, boredom. Now, mm -hmm. do you know which kids are bored in your class? Now, often when I get bored, I look like I'm paying attention, but I'm just sitting there either seething that I'm bored or absolutely mm -hmm. thinking about something completely daydreaming. Right. Now, I need to know that as a teacher. So this is the essence of the notion about seeking feedback from your kids about the impact of your teaching. Now, great teachers do it regularly, regularly, regularly. Some, and I'm probably being a culprit of this in my classes, I just keep going. Uh, I've got a script I need to get through. I've got a lesson I need to get through. I know how to structure it so I can walk out of that room saying, hey, I did a great job. Because the five kids that paid attention that I constantly use to give me my cues um, is what I do. Not good enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the complexity of feedback and being open to the feedback and giving students an opportunity to express their learning, how they're thinking. I think we've got to create more opportunities for that. I, I you know, for me, I, I see it as one of the most underutilized yet um, powerful formative assessment strategies is just getting the students to talk to each other and express themselves to you and go yeah. and listen to them, listen to what they're saying, listen to what they're talking about and how they express their learning. Would you agree with that? Is that one of the powerful things? Well, you know, I want to get, there's, there's a conspiracy out there. Here's yeah. the conspiracy. Kids above average want teachers to talk more about the facts because mm. that's the game they're winners at. It's right. the kids below average that want you to shut up and listen to how <laughs> they're thinking or right. demonstrate how you're thinking so they can better understand what's happening. Right. One of the right. hardest things you say is getting kids, particularly once they get to high school, get, getting them to acknowledge what they don't know, giving them knowledge what their confusions um, right. We've spent a lot of time in this work, and in fact, it was before COVID that we discovered this, but COVID highlighted it dramatically. I remember the breakthrough moment for me was watching one of my PhD students, and Davies, teaching a class where this 14-year-old boy was clearly struggling. 
And she went up to him and she said, can I help you? No, miss, I'm okay. And she knew that he wasn't. And he knew that he wasn't going to tell her. Mm -hmm. And at one moment, she looked over his shoulders and there he was typing into his social media, kind of like Facebook, Edmodo kind of thing, what the problem was he was having to her. And that opened a real vista for us and COVID showed it dramatically. Kids are willing to use social media to talk about what they don't know to the teacher through the various apps or to the other kids that they won't do, even when the teacher's standing there. Right. And I think the biggest revolution facing us is if we can learn how to use social media effectively to create mm -hmm. dialogue about what kids know and don't know. Because if we're going to talk about feedback has its biggest power when you don't know, we've got to make that not just safe, but common. So I just like one of the interesting effect sizes of using iPhones, uh, having an iPhone or Facebook present in class is about minus 0.3. But using iPhones and Facebook on social media, 0.5. Um, hmm. I don't know, Tom, whether you're old enough, but when TV first came <laughs> in, people were saying TV is going to be the worst thing ever happened to right. education. Um, people are now saying iPhones and Facebooks are the worst thing they have social media. I think it's one of the most exciting things. This is yeah. where really the feedback can be so powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we have to keep working at it to make sure that that feedback, uh, as you say, if the students are not acting upon the feedback, then it's just performative. And, and sometimes feedback is more for the families, for the parents, in that the presentation that I thoroughly scrutinize the work as opposed to causing more, more learning. Um, another factor or strategy, if you will, that I want to have you talk a little bit more about is this notion of self-reported grades. Uh, you know, for the most part, uh, I think as students get older, and I know that age is a pretty strong indicator, age and school experience is a pretty strong indicator of accuracy when it comes to self-assessment. I think students have a fairly accurate picture, most of them, of where they are in their learning. Um, and clearly that's necessary because inaccurate self-assessment would be problematic. But are there any potential pitfalls or misunderstanding? When you say self-reported grades have a fairly high effect size, and that that's emerged in the research, um, what are some things we need to look for or maybe some potential pitfalls? Do we go too far? Talk to us a little bit about what that means specifically around self-reported grades. Yeah, this is one I've struggled with, and you know, struggle being a good word here. Um, like the, the biggest downside is that you're right. Uh, by about age eight, kids know where they fit in the hierarchy of the class in terms of achievement. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for many kids, that sets an expectation that is a massive barrier. And I don't care how brilliant the teacher is. If I walk into a class and say, I'm a C student, if I get a C, I'm doing a good job. Mm -hmm. That is the worst thing that could happen. And this is why I say that you know, the, 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 the worst possible mission of education is to help kids reach their potential. But for those kids, it's a damnation. Our job is to help kids exceed what they think their potential is. Right. And so this is the downside of self-reported grades. Um, like many years ago, we used to have this thing called IQ. And yes, it's got a very dirty history, but at least it was an independent measure from achievement about capabilities of kids. Now we don't have it, we don't use it. And so achievement can be a self-perpetuating nightmare for some kids. Um, and there's some brilliant, brilliant musicians, entrepreneurs, business people in our schools that are currently getting Ds and Cs for all kinds of background reasons that are never going to emerge and, and have their success. So self-reported grades can be very much a negative as much as a positive. But the way that I have conceptualized it is turning it on its head and saying, look, if we're going to give kids assessments and grades, isn't it reasonable and right that we should teach the kids how to interpret that information? Right. So we've conceived it in the notion of student assessment capabilities. Um, and I started this many years ago in, in the policy space in my New Zealand days where we were saying, hey, all the stuff about formative assessment and summative assessment, which I'm not a great fan of, um, all the stuff about having teachers use tests or not test is missing the mark. It should be about how do the kids learn from doing an assessment? How do they learn to do better? How do they learn what they didn't do well? How do they learn what they do well? And mm -hmm. here's the beauty. If you put the focus on student assessment capabilities, teachers have to be more formative in their, in, in their evaluation. They have to teach these kids. So when you give a kid a result back tomorrow, um, I want you to wait a day so it's not short-term memory, and then say to the kid, 
tell me what you understand by the grades and the comments I gave you a couple of days ago. And if they can't, I think we're doing damage. Right. Um, so this is this notion of self-reported grades. You can see it's not an easy one, and I've struggled to get it right. Um, but it's not as simple as saying because kids are accurate at getting their grades, this is a good thing. In some cases it is. In some cases it's a disaster. Right. And so getting beyond that and saying let's help kids better understand and make better self-assessments of their uh, and judgments about their work. Right. So they may not be. Uh, they may be accurately determining where they are. Uh, in terms of their learning in this current moment, but then they settle into that level and realize that it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy instead of going through maybe some goal setting and talking about right. challenging goals that can push them higher. Um, you've talked about that in the past, the difference, and I think I've read that also many places, uh, the difference between do your best goals and and challenging goals. Um, clarify that for us a little bit in terms of why why is a do your best goal not necessarily the one we want to target? Because sometimes your best is not good enough. Yeah. Yeah, and if you look at the contrast between challenging goals and do your best, it's about 0.8 on the effect sizes. Okay. Now, and, and I go back to what I said before about boredom. What is boredom? Boredom is the absence of challenge. Right. Uh, if I know kids, uh, my goodness, they love to be challenged. They love to be challenged in their video games and their sport and their social right. life. They th we all thrive on challenges. Now, right. it's the Goldilocks principle, making sure the challenges are not too hard. So you say, hey, what's the point? I'm not going to get there. But not too easy. Like Graham Nuttall said, you know, 40 to 50% of everything taught in every class, the kids know already. Yeah. Oh, my goodness, where's the challenge in that? And the not too boring part of the not too hard, not too easy, not too boring, is if kids are vested in learning, they will take on incredibly challenging tasks. Yeah. And I, I, I see the, the video games that kids like to play as a good metaphor here. Like I'm, I'm still, this dates me, but I'm still obsessed with Angry Birds. <laughs> When you go in, it knows your prior achievement, your last score. Yeah. It knows how to set a challenge for the next level, not too hard, not too easy. Mm -hmm. And I'm incredibly invested in finding ways to get from where I am to that challenge. But what often happens in classrooms is when the kid reaches the challenge, the teacher says, good work, well done, hand it in, go out and play. But in Angry Birds, when I get the challenge, the next level, I want to go into the next level up. And the other thing that happens in Angry Birds is that if I don't get to the next level, it doesn't say, well done, you did your best. It keeps right. it there, which is the reason I want to come back and play that game. Now, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be nice if I had a teacher sitting beside me and teenage kid beside me that could teach me how to get to the next level? Wouldn't it be nice <laughs> if I had a teacher beside me that could help me get to the next level? But mm -hmm. that notion, I, I think that we re, re, really need to reintroduce that concept of challenge in classrooms. Um, and ask kids about that level of challenge because that's what excites them. That's what they want to spend their motivational resources on. That's what gets them interested in learning. Now, here's the good news. It doesn't come first. It comes second. After you start to learn something, you start to enjoy the challenge. Whereas the mistake we often make is we have to make this exercise real world authentic and make it interesting and challenging for the kids. No, get them to learn something so that they start going up those levels of Angry Birds so that they want to reinvest in learning. Yeah, it's uh, it, you make me think of um, looking at the effect sizes and the strategies and the implications in a kind of Venn diagram kind of way. Because as you were talking about the setting goals that were not the Goldilocks principle, if you set goals that are too high, right away it made me think of self-efficacy and the importance of self-efficacy and the belief that I could achieve that goal. And if I set a goal that is too too challenging for me then I and I don't believe I can do it, the goal setting is a counterproductive exercise then. But the overlap between make sure we set challenging goals, but you have efficacy around the ability to reach that goal. And I think that's for me is what, what I thought of as you were going through uh, and talking about that. The... Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is, and I think we touched a little bit on this last week, but I want to finish up with your perspective on inquiry-based learning. Um, I think the fundamentals behind inquiry-based learning are common sense, you know, spark student curiosity, have them use that curiosity, to develop a question or questions, and then have them explore or inquire to find the solution or the information or whatever was driving the question uh, in the first place. But inquiry-based learning does not yield as high an effect size as one might anticipate in terms of the impact. So are we overselling the benefits of inquiry-based learning or is it like so many things, it's all in the implementation and the lower effect sizes are due to poor implementation uh, of that sort of approach to learning? Look, I want to 
let's start by looking at the cognitive complexity question. Okay. That helps address what you're saying. And I see that in terms of three levels. The idea is the contents, the facts. Okay. And in the past, I've been calling that the surface level. Um, John Biggs, who started that term many years ago, is a good friend. And I was talking to him a few years ago and he said, I, I, you've misused that term. I think surface is shallow. And that's what he said. And I felt very guilty about that, but let me, let me go on and come back. So that surface, that content, that facts. The second is the deep level. And this is when we start to relate ideas and how do we put together and build coat hangers and conceptual understanding. And the third level surely is the transfer, how we transfer our understanding to new situations. Mm -hmm. Now that surface deep and transfer um, in the new work, I'm relabeling it as knowing that. What is that which we need to know? The knowing how mm -hmm. and the knowing with. With this, how can we go into other areas? I'm keeping the deep surface and transfer because it's kind of more catchy than knowing that, knowing how and knowing with. But yeah. saying that when you're preparing a lesson, you need to look at all three parts. You need to look at what is the content the kids need to know, but you have to go beyond that and say, how do we get to the relationships? And then beyond that, on certain occasions, to get to the transfer. Going back to last week, 90% you know, of classes from the kids' point of view is about the knowing that, the content. 90-odd um, percent of the questions we ask at state standardised testing is about the content, despite what the psychometricians say. <laughs> I don't think that's defensible. I also pointed out the conspiracy that kids above average want more content because that's the game the winners are. Yeah. Now, in the new work, I talk about this notion of intentional alignment. And I'm saying, teachers, you probably need to have two success criteria. One about the content and the ideas the kids need, and one about the deeper relational and transfer aspects that you want to have in this class. You probably need two activities. So it's crystal clear to the kids that there's the content and there's the deep. You probably need to have two assessment pieces of information that's clear to the kids. Like in my teaching at the university level for the last many years, I've taught this course in instructional leadership and I have two assignments. Believe it or not, Tom, the first assignments on calculating effect sizes. Mm -hmm. And I want them to know how to calculate an effect size. Mm -hmm. It's the surface level. It's the knowing that. I want that. It's valuable. The second assignment is they put it together and they make interpretations from it. And I want to make it crystal. I don't want the students to have to guess what I value. Right. Like I know in undergraduate university essays that the biggest correlate of success is the number of references. Um, despite what I say, I want the students to tell me back the facts. Now, I don't think that's defensible. So I want all three. Now, coming back to answer your question, it turns out that there are some teaching methods that are better for the content level, like direct instruction. And there are some that are better for the deep level, like inquiry learning. Mm -hmm. The mistake is that if we go into inquiry, inquiry learning before we have the content, no wonder it has a low effect size. And the reason it has a low effect size across many, many studies is it's usually used by religious messiahs who say we're an inquiry-based school, we're a discovery school. We leave kids behind. And last week I pointed out my, my uh, sort of moment when I discovered this by looking at the work in medical schools. First year medicine, inquiry learning, problem-based learning, zero to negative. Right. Fourth year, 0.5. I went back through all the studies in schools, got the same effect size. And hence this instruction, this intentional alignment. How do we make sure that the kids are aware that what we're actually valuing here is the content or the relationships? And Tom, I'm greedy. I want both. Yeah. It's not either or. And all this debate about guided learning and discovery learning, it misses the point. There's a time for it and there's not a time for it. Amongst our team, we call it the Kenny Rogers model. You got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to play them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it makes life harder, but it does say that don't dismiss problem-based learning. There is a right time for it. We almost need a readiness test before we do it. Are the kids ready to go into it? And right. really good implementations of problem-based learning do do that. And right. so let's get away from saying, "I'm this kind of teacher." No, there's a right time. Now, here's the fascination, Tom. We went back, Bob Mazzano wrote a book on 385 teaching methods, and we tried to align those methods to the various levels of cognitive complexity. 300, we threw out the window. No wonder it's confusing for kids. We're now teaching methods don't align with what we value and what we ask the kids to do. Yeah. And so I'm hoping that future researchers will get smarter about 
how you come up with a teaching method that crosses the various levels of learning. In fact, we can only find two, the jigsaw method and a method called Padilla. Um, mm -hmm. Like take think, pair, share. Why don't we add no think, pair, share? Take direct mm -hmm. instruction and reciprocal right. teaching. They have differential effects. Put them together. Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't want to teach dirt, direct instruction, reciprocal teaching? Mm -hmm. And so Kenny Rogers, there's a right time for various teaching methods and there's a wrong time. Right. I think labeling sometimes boxes us in and, and we don't really sort of use the breadth of strategies that are effective. And, and it makes at me, right I think it's time. such, yeah, at the right time. And, and, and the wise advice is that, you know, you're making me think that uh, as if I don't have the knowledge base, if I don't have sort of content discipline expertise or some level of competence, my question is going to be very superficial that drives my inquiry versus having some knowledge and then asking a question of curiosity where I have a deeper understanding, which will probably yield a more sophisticated question from the learner. Well, let's be careful here. My, no. my colleague uh, Manak Kapoor says, maybe you should start with the problem based to yeah. work out what the kids know and don't know. Oh, that's Teach fair. That. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there's both directions, right? Correct. I mean, you could you could start with the question, but sometimes I can look at that when I when a teacher looks at you and says, well, "What are you curious about?" and I might say, "I don't know. I don't know anything about this. I don't have any idea." So I probably have to learn something. But I like the idea of problem. I think it's in in all directions, and I love the idea of being open to the notion that there isn't one way or one direction or we're this kind of school, but we have a sophistication about us as a profession to understand the right time for the right approach to way to, the way to enhance the learners for sure. Um, before we get to the last question, John, I just want to uh, ask you, you've talked a little bit about the upcoming book, but I just want to give you an opportunity to uh, promote anything that's coming up for you. You've got the new book. Do you want to give us a title? Uh, any upcoming events, conferences in North America that you might be a part of? Anything you want to talk about where you're going to be, where people can connect with you? Um, anything. Just go ahead and promote yeah. anything that's coming up for you. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. look, uh, I have finished the, the new book. I'm not calling it a second edition. Okay. Um, because one of the one of the criticisms from my very very closest colleagues was when an effect size for an influence changes say from 0.61 to 0.62 they say oh which was right which was wrong how can it change yeah. so I'm calling it a sequel um, okay. and it's different from the first in that I put a lot of the story up front okay. and put the data afterwards right. and I've changed the barometer to a thermometer and I've tried to it will have a lot of similarities, but it is. And the biggest effect, obviously, is in 2009, I had 800 meta-analyses. Now I've got 2,100. Right. Uh, so the world's moved on. And so touch wood, that will come out in March. Um, mm -hmm. I'm working on a, another book at the moment um, with um, uh, Dylan William and uh, Aaron Hamilton on de-implementation. How do we get teachers and principals to stop things? Right. Not an easy thing. Now, we're not there yet, but it's it's fun doing doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I've got another, I'm killing trees here, Tom. I've got a, a few others <laughs> underway. I'm writing yeah. uh, last year, uh, early this year, I'm very proud of the book we published on visible learning for parents that I wrote with mm -hmm. my son. Yeah. And we so enjoyed the experience that um, we, we're doing another one on um, how you're creating a learning community. Um, so th those are the things that I'm working on at the moment. It's, it's wonderful being retired uh, that you can do those things. Right. I have a bit of hiccup in my day today with that particular son. I'm writing a book. Um, my sixth grandchild is due. We thought it was coming last night, so we might have had to delay this podcast. The yeah. new baby delayed for us, Tom. So That's why I appreciate that. that. Part of my <laughs> presence at the moment. Uh, yeah. Since COVID, uh, yep, I am enjoying the smell of airplanes again. Uh, yeah. I am coming to your country, in fact, in a couple of weeks, Ohio, Texas. Um, and I love to get out and talk about these things. So, um, the Corwin website, um, who oversee all yeah. the stuff, they have all my itinerary and that stuff the on there about where I am. And I hope there is an opportunity. As you can hear, Tom, I love talking about the stuff. I, I love hearing do. from people. I love standing in their shoes and seeing it from their point of view. Um, so I got plenty to do. Um, I also um, have a political role here in Australia as the chair of a federal owned uh, agency in education, the Australian Institute for Teaching and School Leaders, and really loving that job. It allows me to get. Uh, working with ministers, um, director general, superintendents in your term on a very regular basis. And yeah. so plenty to do, really enjoying it and uh, look forward to doing more. Fantastic. Uh, we, we certainly look forward to uh, all of that uh, being available to us. The question about what we're going to stop doing. I don't know an educator on this planet that's not busy. 
but some tend to have more be more effective than others. And so it really is a question sometimes of what am I prepared to stop doing? And, and what are we as a school prepared to stop doing from a principal's perspective to make room for that which is necessary to really maximize student achievement? Okay, last question as we finish up, John. I really appreciate your time this week uh, and certainly in both parts, both last week and this week. But this is a question I finish every interview with and it's just a question that you can take either personally or professionally or again, whatever direction you wanna go. But it's a simple question that asks you about the definition of success. If a random person stopped you on the street and asked you, what is your definition of success? How would you answer them? I see it very much in terms of having a positive impact on others. And that begs all kinds of questions about positive, about the notion of impact. What right do I have um, to have an impact on others? They're all powerful questions, which surely is the essence of what it means to be a teacher. And, you know, our business is improvement. Um, our business is change and it really does beg the moral imperative question about that which is the essence of being a human being is that if I want to improve another person you know do I have the rights do I have the the permission not easy particularly as many of our constituents are six and seven and eight year olds and so that essence of what it means to be successful is seeing that you do have and having an influence and improvement on other people and at the same time hoping to improve yourself. Right. Yeah, I think the impact on others, the impact on ourselves and and determining what our levels of success are and just asking those questions about what it means and and what does impact mean and how great can that impact be. So, uh wonderful. Uh John uh Listeners, John has no uh, social media presence. Uh, usually at this point, I list people's Twitter handles and, and Instagram, but John is not on social media. But you can certainly connect with John's work, uh, and, and we'll get that uh, website, the Corwin website, and, of course, visible-learning.org also. And, and then, of course, the Hattie Family Foundation is also uh, Hattie ff.org as well. We'll have links in the show notes for, for all of that. Um, John, I can't thank you enough for joining me last week, this week. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to meet you. Uh, certainly you are an inspiration to so many educators around the world. And we appreciate the fact that you're going to keep going, keep publishing, keep researching, and we look forward to the new information. Really nice to meet you. Again, thanks for doing this. Thank you, Tom. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcasts. Now let's get back to the episode. In Assessment Corner this week, I want to talk about the good old test. Now, when we usually talk about balanced assessment, we think of balanced as the balanced use between the formative and summative purposes of assessment. A balanced approach doesn't mean one for one. It just means we understand both purposes and we employ them strategically in our classrooms. That's definitely what is meant when most people talk about balanced assessment. But the balanced assessment I want to talk about is one that came up this past week on a few occasions during a couple of my workshops. And I want to set the context and give you a sense of how, where it came from and why I'm going in this direction. Now, a couple of weeks ago, you might recall that I was talking about the fractured relationship that can exist between the formative and summative purposes of assessment, right? And one of those very obvious fractures emerges when we teach to outcomes or standards, right? And standards and outcomes are organized by strands, categories, and domains. But then we organize our grade books by task type tests, quizzes, assignments, projects, labs, things like that. That the name or the nature of the event is how we organize evidence of learning. So we want to shift that. We want to make sure that the name or the nature of the event is not the organizing or driving factor behind how we organize the evidence of learning in our grade books. We want that to be the strand, the category, the standards, etc. So I was presenting that content on two separate occasions last week in two separate cities. But during both of those workshops, I was asked both publicly and privately, I was asked a question about tests. And it was kind of a tangential question, which a little bit surprised me, I suppose, but but it sort of came up. And if I were to synthesize the questions that were asked, it was basically a question of, so are you saying, Tom, that we shouldn't have tests anymore? And the short answer to that is, of course, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. And I talked a little bit about you know tests in the opener as well. Um, but this got me thinking about the good old tests, right? This got me thinking about what do we do with tests? Because just because a test is not the organizing driver of how we organize evidence of learning in our gradebook doesn't mean we don't still have tests anymore. So the notion of tests itself got me thinking. 
And certainly over the past few years, I've talked about tests, the couple of years that we've had the podcast. I've alluded to this on several occasions. I've talked about tests, I think, before. I'm not quite sure. But look, this is episode 85, so I don't really remember what I said, episode one, episode six, episode 20. Um, And if you're not going to send me questions for Assessment Corner, I'm just just going to riff off of what happened to me in the previous week, uh, regardless of whether or not I've talked about it before. So um, I don't really know what I've said before. So that's just to get those questions into me if you've got things you want me to talk about as far as assessments concerned. All right, there you go. Shameless plug. Uh, Email me uh, questions if you have them. Okay, let's get get back on track here. Now, when I think of balanced assessment, I also think about a balance of assessment methods, but more importantly, a balance of assessment formats. Now, we know assessment methods are not interchangeable. You got to make sure that the method matches what you're assessing. I think, especially in our current assessment paradigm, we certainly need to make room for other ways of assessing. I think so many have turned to inquiry-based learning or problem-based learning or project-based learning or exploratory type learning. Many have turned to that because we rightfully understand that a test in its traditional form can be a very limited view of what a student knows or can do. And I talked a little bit about that in the opening, as I said. It's a limited view, yes, at times, but it's not non-existent, right? We can't just dismiss it as being not credible at all. I think we have to be careful not to swing the pendulum too far. Like we say we need to provide alternative assessments, and I'm all for that. But if you swing the pendulum too far, you may just be kind of alienating a different cohort of students or removing one type of experience from from their entire experience. Tests are real. Tests are real. They They are things that exist in our society. There's the bar exam. There's medical exams. There's licensing for many professions. Tests are real. And you're right. Tests are not everything, but they're not nothing. To pretend that tests aren't or can't be authentic, it's, it's just not true. Yes, of course, a test can be artificial and disjointed from learning, sure. But to dismiss tests altogether is short-sighted and, quite honestly, it's thoughtless. The sort of default dismissal of anything in assessment because it's what we used to do or because some outside source uses it, that to me is misguided. We just have to stop toiling in these caricatures that are at times true, but that aren't helpful when it comes to deepening our assessment literacy. So that said, we do need to also reconsider how we examine tests and how we utilize the evidence that emerges from them. And this is where the conversation went during the workshops. While we still might have tests, the way we gather the evidence is going to have to change. So I want to try to offer just a a very quick sort of contrast between sort of the old mindset around tests versus maybe the old school versus new school when it comes to to tests, right? So the the old school, let's have tests sort of looking at that. There's this whole idea of just like we teach, there's teach, 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 teach. We might sprinkle in a few smaller assessments, but we teach some more. And at the end of a unit, there's this epic unit test at the end that assesses multiple standards and everything that we've covered in the unit. Now, that test typically would would have a, a mix of questions. There'd be recall questions, short answer questions, maybe some interpretive answers, you know, maps, passages, graphic organizers, climographs, whatever. And then there'd be the longer answers, extended written responses at the end of the test, right? There'd be multiple standards assessed. Even the underpinnings and targets would all be meshed together. And they would be meshed together by question types. So you'd have multiple choice questions about some of the underpinnings and definitions. And then you'd have the standards all mixed in together. We take that entire testing situation and we come up with a singular score at the end, right? You get a 58 out of 73, right? So they got a 79% on the test and... You know, I don't know why I said 73. I mean, there's, we've all had those teachers like the test is 73 questions. Like really, 70 questions weren't enough. You had to get three more in there. It's got to be out of 73 so no one can figure out their, what their grade is without a calculator. Anyway, the questions are mixed together. They're all at various levels of cognitive rigor, um, which essentially renders the score meaningless since that ratio, 73 or 79%, is useless because the questions on the test aren't even comparable. So we just get this singular score and we just know that there are certain scores that are acceptable and that we want, that are desirable, but they don't really help us. So let's think about a new mindset when it comes to tests, right? So maybe we start organizing the test by standard, especially if it's possible to separate the standards, right? And we talked about synthesizing the standards a couple of weeks ago, uh, a few weeks ago, and that could be part of it as well. But let's just say, for example, we organize the test by standard or strand or category or whatever. We organize it so that 
the standards-based evidence is easier to identify, right? So there's section A, there's section B, section C. Each of those sections deals with one of the standards, if it's possible to separate. Now, maybe you have section A and then section B, which lead to section C, which are the three standards. I, I think you know where I'm going with this, but the test is reorganized not by question type, but the test itself is reorganized by the standard or the standards that are being assessed. Now, the underpinnings, like the definitions, the formulas, the targets, those would, would be dealt with throughout the learning progression. So we'd already have confirmation that the students have that. So we're, gonna, we're not going to wait until test day to check whether or not they have the, the key terminology and all of that. That should be dealt with during the learning progression. That should be dealt with during the formative process. That should be all handled so that when it comes to test time, we are actually meeting the standards. So when the test rolls around, we have confirmation that the students have the ingredients necessary to make the meal, as I like to say, now it's just time for them to make the meal. You don't need those questions on the test. You don't need questions on the ingredients because they are baked into the question. Like I always try to say, if I baked a cake and forgot to use sugar, you're going to taste it. If you're an expert baker, you're gonna know exactly what ingredients I'm missing. You don't need separate questions or prompts about whether or not I used enough sugar. You'll taste it in the cake that I make. And as, as a teacher, your expertise allows you to spot where some of those deficiencies, if you will, are emerging and how the students are demonstrating the learning. That your expertise is what allows you to figure out why the demonstration falls short of excellence, okay? Now, from the test, you may end up extracting multiple grades or multiple levels or multiple scores, right? Each standard may have a score. So it's not one test where there's a grade or a score on the test, but you might have three. Here's how you, how you did with this standard, here's how you did with that standard, and here's how you did with the other standard, okay? Now, there are some complexities. Um, some of the skills will need to be synthesized, but, you know, and, and you may have to pull them together and you wanna create these rich experiences for students. I get that. But if we could just get away from the idea that there's a test and you got one singular score on that test, we could actually be much more thoughtful about the kind of evidence we could extract from a test-like situation. Tests are real, okay? We cannot pretend that these are not an authentic way of assessing because, as one of my favorite expressions that I use all the time, is that engineers solve equations, meaning they solve equations that represent authentic questions that they're facing. And that's every bit as authentic as any other type of assessment. Now, obviously it needs to be the right fit, but there's nothing inherently less authentic in a test than any other assessment. It's really what the substance of the assessment is. A poorly designed assessment, well, that's another question. If you have a poorly designed test, but you can also have a poorly designed inquiry-based project. So if design is the important factor, then we need to pay attention to design, okay? But we definitely, we definitely have to reimagine the good old test, right? We have to, the traditional format is definitely antiquated. So we have to reimagine what a quote unquote test might look like. And if we can reimagine it and be sure that it's not our exclusive go-to, but reimagine it as part of a balanced assessment system and be thoughtful about the makeup of the test and the type of evidence that's drawn from them, then there is definitely room in any balanced approach to assessment for the good old test. That's it for this week. Remember to follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. Also, please email the pod, tomshimmerpod at gmail.com if you've got questions for me for Assessment Corner, and I just mentioned that just a moment ago, uh, or if you have any suggestions or feedback for me about the podcast. And a reminder to check the show notes for the links for the upcoming professional learning events this fall. Next week, my guest will be Joe Feldman. Joe is the author of Grading for Equity, so that is exactly what we dig into next week. Please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast, especially on Apple Podcasts, but a rating and review on any of the platforms will help grow the podcast's reach. And if you like what you hear, please keep spreading the word about the podcast to your friends, your colleagues, on social media, or somewhere else. I would really appreciate that. Have a great week, everyone. Bye.